Good afternoon to, to everyone. Uh, thank, thank you for joining our workshop today, our webinar uh, hosted by Alliance of Angels and, T2, and T2D3, uh, uh, Stain, who's, right, who, who is the author and also of that particular publication and also our presenter for today. Right? So uh, before we get started, I would like to uh, share a bit of logistics. We, we do want this to be an interactive session. Right? So if, if you have a burning question for our speaker, feel free to jump in. And uh, I think that's a, that's a great way to, to get some energy up and be able to have everyone uh, participate and, and learn more together. But also, right, again, if you are not uh, speaking, we do ask that you please put your device on mute, right? So we, we don't have you know, your, your cat or your kid, uh, etc. cetera, you know, participate in our session. So in, with a, a nice and uh, positive, uh, quiet learning environment, right? So I, I'm going to start by sharing a, a little bit about my organization to get us started. Uh, I run, my name is E. Jane and I run the Alliance of Angels. It's an angel investing group here in Seattle. Uh, we have 140 angel investors in the organization. Every year we put about 10 million into 20 companies, give or take. Right? Most companies that are fundraising from us, they are looking for a total of between half a mil to 1.5 right, million. And our typical check size is 250 to 500. Right? Uh, so uh, if you are currently fundraising, you're interested in learning more about my organization, my email is right down here. We are, we are otherwise like sector agnostic and stage agnostic. And we focus principally on companies that are headquartered in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, are there any angel investors on the call and you're interested in learning more about the organization, uh, feel free also to reach out. My contact is again on this slide. And with that, uh, again, it's our privilege today to have Stein join us. He's going to, uh, Stein, I'm sorry, to have Stein join us. I apologize for butchering his name. Uh, and he's going to share with us a little more about the cheat codes to, to scalable and sustainable growth, right? And with that, I'm going to stop talking. I'm also going to stop sharing my screen and I'd like to hand it over to our speaker for today. Thank you, uh, AJ. I, uh... <laughs> to start with apologizing, I, I wasn't aware that we didn't have a waiting room. So when AJ and I were chatting a little bit, uh, I suddenly saw that we were, chat we were chatting to all of you. Thank you for joining and thanks for having me and thanks for the nice words, uh, AJ. I, uh, I'm also local here in Seattle. My, uh, you know, my camera is not uh, pointing in the right direction, but next to the water here and uh, really excited to, uh, to talk with you as a, as a local group. I have too much content for an hour. <laughs> a lot of that um, is going to be covered either in the book or on a lot of, a lot of other publications I have. So I'm, but I'm going to try to touch on a lot of different topics to at least you know, skim the surface. Uh, cheat codes, maybe. Uh, mostly best practices, things that I didn't do very well and learned from and share now with others. Um, and all around this notion of T2D3 um, growth, which was a, it's an acronym that was coined by um, Niraj Agrawal from Battery Ventures somewhere, I think 2015. Um, and there's a couple of blog articles on it, but not, not a lot else. And, and what's challenging is when you, um, when you look at all the literature out there, there are a lot of books about the earlier stages of, uh, of SaaS growth, like how do you get to you know, MVP, how do you, how do you get started? Uh, zero to one, you know, lean startup, books like that. But when you think about this, this next stage, how do you turn that growth into exponential growth? There's a lot of, um, a lot of depth uh, that is also hard to actually, to capture in one book. And, and I'm not gonna pretend that I've been able to, but I've, I've touched on a couple of things because the challenge really is to do a lot of things in parallel. And I think as angel investors, you may, either get involved in an investment like this at this stage of growth, but, or you, you're maybe part, or you're of course trying to lead a company in that direction, right? Where they now have to do more than one or two things really well. You can get to MVP, you can get to product market fit, honestly, by finding one demand gen lever that really works for you to get extreme loyalty from your customers, right? And then driving referrals, et cetera. And that's how you can get to a couple million in ARR and maybe even sometimes even to 10 million in ARR by, by really mastering one thing, one part of the market, one beachhead, 
and nailing that. But then if you got to get to 20, 30, 50, 100 million ARR, there's no way that you can do that without doing all the things that you uh, see here in this formula at the same time, right? And there's many ways to write this. This is not, you know, mathematically correct per se, but it gives you a sense of when you need to go beyond 5, 10 million ARR and get really to this higher scale, uh, you know, velocity, you need to do a lot of things in parallel. Uh, demand gen uh, diversification, conversion optimization, across the full funnel, not just marketing, but sales and renewals and, and expansion, ARPU expansion, which includes things like serious product marketing, like price strategy, upsell cross sell, um, getting your CAC under control. Not only your CAC, but it's somewhere else you cost two servers, right? If you, if you get bigger and bigger and bigger, now the, the cost to servers becomes very important for profitability. And all of that, of course, while you uh, keep churn numbers, um, at the at the level that is healthy for the the market segment you're in and this is hard and and it's especially hard when when companies especially when they get series a funding and they're about to go on this part of the journey uh, it is also easy with all those new resources to do a lot of things in parallel that might not all be uh, managed correctly right and it's good to do a little experimentation you want to go fast but you also don't want to burn through all your resources without by basically learning <laughs> learning on the job. Uh, so I'd like to cover a couple of these things today and then and, 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 and ask you to also chime in and ask questions. And then when we don't get really deep into something, we could maybe have a follow-up conversation or there's other content that I can share um, that will dive deep into some of these topics. The first example, maybe of going back to that formula that I just shared of, of two numbers on that in that formula that are really interesting. If you're doing diligence on an investment or you're looking at sort of where is a company struggling, I find this picture always very um, a very helpful starting point. How is the the go-to-market strategy, the go-to-market engine that a company either is building, has built, or envisions building, right, with maybe some of the investment capital they're looking for, how is that engine, a sales-led model, a product marketing-led model, a product growth-led model, or a more of a sort of demand gen led model. How is that model that go to market, which has a certain structure to it, a certain cost, uh, uh, a, a cost um, um, component, how is that related to, for example, the ACV that you um, think you can, you can, your product can, um, uh, it can demand from the market? What is the ARPU, the revenue per unit, right? Unit being per customer usually or per user that can really support the right go-to market model. And there are some, uh, just some um, rules of thumb here, but if you, if you, for example, have a sales-led growth model and you're investing in, in hiring relatively expensive salespeople, that is extremely hard to sustain unless you, your average deal size, your, your average you know, selling price in the first year, the, the ACV over time, the ARPU, if you think of the unit being a customer, Unless that's over $100,000, it's extremely hard to actually afford a sales-led growth go-to-market. Marketing-led growth, same thing. If you want to buy clicks from Google or you want to compete for high organic search rank positions, if you want to do inbound through certain types of sponsorships, event marketing, etc., especially as a category gets mature, it becomes expensive. So unless you, you can command an, an ACV of, let's say, 10000 uh, dollars per year, it's extremely hard to actually fund that go to market for a longer period of time. It doesn't mean you cannot get off the ground with that, but you, your longer term sort of vision has to include how do you make those economics work. Um, so yeah, so that's a, just a, an initial sort of shot um, out of the gate on sort of how you do a diligence maybe on the realities of this equation as a company builds their plan uh, to go to market. One of the things that is, uh, is helpful for me to um, do first is to see where are they on their journey versus small B2B SaaS company. And not just B2B, this also goes for B2C. Uh, where are they in the journey sort of going from achieving a minimum viable product, right? Having a couple maybe of paying customers or specifically customers who pay with their time, right? Who help you build your product. That's kind of, that's the MVP milestone. How do you... Uh, know if you're there already and if you're getting closer to product market fit, PMF, really more about multiple customers, a larger number of customers paying you, but also staying with you, pay and stay, and, and maybe even attracting sort of early adopters um, who also start, you know, referring others. And 
you can sort of start to measure the value in more economic ways, right? Where MVP is more about people voting with their feet and with their time, and, and product market fit is more voting um, in, in with economic things you can measure. Because you know, you need to know if you actually reach product market fit before you can double down uh, and, and do the investments that are required to get to T to D3 growth, right? Where you will double down in a certain part of the market. You will have to understand what your ideal customer profile is based on your product market fit achievement before you pour a whole bunch of money into uh, trying to win a certain market segment, right? Or trying to invest in a certain go-to market model, hire salespeople, for example. Um, because T2D3 is all about those all the, doing all those things at the same time, but it just mentioned, right? To drive revenue expansion, demand gen diversification, having a, a more thorough approach to retention and building a customer success function. Uh, and all those things uh, are gonna be costly. And it's important that you do that after you've reached product market fit. And that's why I also use the, the baseball diamond to make, you know, you cannot really go from second base to fourth or, or sorry, from first to, to third, for example, it's, it's very hard. You can go very fast from one base to another, but skipping one is usually not a good idea. And it's, it usually means companies have to go back in time a little bit and fix those things. Let me stop there before I move on. Any, any thoughts, any questions? Okay, I'll just keep moving. I'm moving at a relatively rapid pace and I'll try to pause here and there and, and then AJ also feel free to just interrupt me if there's people with a question or a note and I, and I don't uh, watch the chat box. So this is kind of the, um, the cheat sheet that I use when I, don't, when I cannot ask a lot of questions, when I just say, hey, what's your ARR? How big is your team? To sort of see where a company is. But these numbers are very far from uh, perfect. Uh, they're really only a, a very uh, rough uh, sort of categorization. There's an interesting row here, the top line. I got that from a McKinsey study that it's, it's actually a couple of years old already, but it's kind of measured how, how many companies actually make it to each of these milestones uh, out of uh, companies that they really defined as B2B SaaS, pure B2B SaaS companies. Uh, and there's a little bit of uh, it's sort of my take on how big these teams typically can get uh, and what you do to drive growth. I have a more detailed sort of checklist. So this is kind of your <laughs> big back of the napkin, quick, uh, hey, wh where are you about-ish? But if you have a little more time and you can actually ask specific questions about customer momentum, user momentum, there's this longer list and I'll share all these slides, of course, that maybe allows you to get a little bit more of a sense of where is a company. Um, the check boxes, the check marks and the square boxes are just because this was an example. So it doesn't really mean anything other than, <laughs> than these are just the bullets that you can use to assess. Where do you think a certain company is on this journey? Uh, you'll find questions here like, you know, are we already getting customers to refer orders, right? Which is a good sign of, of product market fit actually relatively far uh, on that maturity curve. And how many paying customers do you have? How many uh, customers are paying you but churned, right? Uh, or have paid you and churned. How many have never paid you and churned, right? All those things are, are super interesting to see where does a company uh, fit? And then what else is there to do for them to complete a certain master, right? To get to second base, to really finish their product market fit uh, journey. And then I have a, an easier version of this here that is just focused on product market fit because I thought when, when I think of, of this group, huh, Angel Investing, You'll, you'll invest in a lot of companies where you trust that there's an MVP and there's a good idea. There might be even a little bit of customer momentum, but getting that to be so scalable and so proven that you're willing to, 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 to go get Series A money, you really need to get the product market fit, right? And this is kind of my, my short list of check boxes <laughs> to see uh, to, in a five-minute conversation how far a company is to, uh, to get the product market fit. Let me stop there. This is kind of the, the company journey. Now I'm going to transition to the, the journey, the maturity of a category. Any questions so far? Any thoughts? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, this is Magnus. I wonder, uh, to get the product market fit in a B2B space, which is disruptive uh, or, say, a new product category, how do you get your first uh, paying customer in, in that scenario? Do you... Uh, discount heavily or do you give it away for free or I, I've seen all, all of the above but I haven't seen a good place where you actually charge say a 
several hundred thousand dollars for an for an enterprise product for the first handful of customers. Yeah, no, I wish there was one answer. Right? But it, it totally. Depends. Are you selling something that's ten dollars a month or a hundred thousand dollars per year, right? Or and what is kind of your uh, your motion is it a, a pure B two B play, or is there a lot of user recruitment involved early? And do you expect those users to really be voting uh, with either their feed by by actually using your product, or by even even getting a financial commitment, right? Signing up for that first trial and turning it into a paid trial uh, by convincing their boss that they can pull the credit card and and you know get one hundred twenty dollars for annual subscription on the card, for example. Yeah, so Max, I don't know that there's not a single answer to that question, I think, but, but you have to really be focused on that, right? Getting from that MVP stage to product market fit is all about economic validation. And, and but, but maybe what helps in this list is that you almost have to do a couple of other things before you can expect people to pay, right? You have to make sure that they're actually using it, that they're actually, you know, finding value in using it. They come back and they use it again, right? Um, they may even give you feedback. They tell you what they like, they tell you what's missing. I think those are all really good leading indicators that you're about to find the, the, the right moment to actually send them a, an invoice, right? Or to ask them to pay for a trial or whatever kind of the, depending the, the, the size of uh, the ticket size of what you're doing, what the right kind of payment infrastructure is and the right economic um, transaction. But I, I think you need to kind of get to some of those before you can ask for payment. Yeah, so, so just to follow. So do you recommend free trials or do you want, should we require paid trials? Okay, that's not, that's a whole topic. I actually would love to, I have a whole section on pricing that I'm not going to cover today. I have a whole webinar on that because a freemium premium model is fundamentally different than a try-buy model. So in a freemium premium model, you're typically going after a market that is over serviced and there is a part of the market that needs less yeah, that's what canva basically did with, with uh, adobe uh, in the in the designer market and that's where a freemium premium model works fine because you have a part of the market that will never pay because you, you can, they, they need a, a commodity set of features and that you, it allows you to get them sort of hooked on your product or just drive awareness so that you can sell them on your premium that's a freemium premium strategy try buy is much more suited for a, a market where you're trying to differentiate where you have a high value product a premium solution you're not willing to give it away for free but to communicate the value you need people to use it and that's where a try buy model is far more applicable because you're not really giving anything away for free you're, you're really letting them try it for a limited amount of time so yeah, big topics. Uh, thanks for the question, though. I, I think I'd love to have a follow up on that, but I, I hope that kind of makes sense. That freemium, premium, and try buy is, yes, fundamentally different, um, depending a little bit on what you're trying to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Um, so we talked a little bit about where are, you know, companies on this maturity journey. What often is forgotten when you do an assessment on where you are and what's the right go-to market strategy, given that sort of situa situational awareness is what I often call it, is how mature the category itself is, right? And there are many ways to think about this. Uh, I like to use the Jeffrey Moore, crossing the chasm model, it, come, it, will, it will come back in the next slide actually. Uh, but you have to kind of think about, hey, is this a mature market where I can, you know, name the category. I, I know kind of what, what market I am actually competing in, right? It has been defined. There might be analysts following it. There might be a Captera, a category name uh, and other players that are identified. Uh, in a mature market, you'll see more PE activity, m &A activity, maybe even. Uh, when you try to sell, <laughs> customers require, they want references. They maybe even ask you for a discount, right? There's all these things that are good indicators that a category is relatively mature. That's a very different place to be in as a startup, as a B2B SaaS uh, venture, as in an immature market where you have to do some of the education, where you might be the first actually to solve a certain problem. It might not even be have been defined, right? So the cost of educating the market uh, is probably high. It's probably cheaper for you to buy clicks, right? It's easier to compete for organic search positions, right? There's all these things that are huge advantages of an immature market but it's also costlier. And it's really important to realize where you are. So I like to kind of combine these two dimensions. One is this, the vertical axis that you see here that is, hey, have I reached product market fit? This is about you as a company, right? Am I ready to, to pour gasoline on the fire and go into T2D3 growth mode? 
Um, but how does that relate to the maturity of the category that I'm in? Because let me give you an example. If a, if a category is very mature and you're a new entrant who's going to disrupt this category with a completely new uh, pricing model, you're going to give away, this, you're going to do a freebie and premium uh, per the question that was just asked, uh, like what Canva did in the Adobe um, scenario, right? They come in to disrupt an existing category that is mature. If you do that, um, the economics will be vastly different from trying to do the same thing in a younger category. In a mature market, a mature category, the price of buying a Google click will be very high. It might not even be economical to do so. It will be hard to compete for organic search positions. So, so driving organic growth and, and great content marketing will have a completely different um, th there will be a, a very different reality there when you have to compete with the Capteras of the world and the software advisors of the world who are very good at the, at the organic search game. Then when you're in a new category, I mean, an immature market, where you have maybe a lot of white space, where you can easily buy clicks for, for a low price because nobody's really competing for those yet. And in both scenarios, you could be the market entrant who's just reached product market fit and is ready to double down and is, comes with 10 million in Series A funding and is ready to, to really invest with, in a mature category that will be very different than in an immature category. And that's what I try to sort of visualize here. And I, I like to dumb it down to really two options that you have. One is you can go for world dominance <laughs> by trying to be the market maker. And if you get through the T2D3 growth curve early enough in the category maturity, you might make it. You might be because you were first and because you maybe were able to win a, a big beachhead, built out that beachhead, and, and T2D3 growth would be the proof point of that, right? If you're able to get that exponential growth. Now you're well positioned to dominate a category and to be, be what's called the market maker, where you set the rules, right? Whether it's the rule for the price that people pay or how this problem gets named, how it's positioned, how the market gets defined, right? That's it's phenomenal, but you have to be fast, right? You have to be first uh, in that younger market. This doesn't happen a lot, right? But what is far more common is that you're shaking up an existing market, either through a differentiation or a disruption play. Right, you're either, back to the Canva Adobe example, you're disrupting an existing market by providing a solution that is servicing a part of that market that is over-serviced, right? Adobe had a lot of design customers, consumers, maybe better, who were not design specialists and, and for whom the Adobe tool set was too rich and too much, right? And, and Canva really played into that with a disrupt play with a different price level, much easier to use product, et cetera very different from a differentiation play, where you also see competitors compete with Adobe, uh, Figma maybe comes to mind, or, or certain like Miro, certain tools that don't really do everything around design, but they do a couple things and they do it really, really well. And they're differentiating in a segment, a sub-segment of what you could do with, for example, the Adobe tool set, and now they're able to, to charge a premium for that. They can be a premium player who really, services an underserviced part of the market, right? Where Canva serviced an overserviced part of the market. Designers don't need all the Adobe tools. Maybe um, Figma goes after the designers who need something very specific. They need to be able to mock up user experiences in a software application and be able to, to show how the interaction of a user with the screens works, right? Which Figma does really well. And, and Adobe is not as good as, or not as focused on that, right? So, so now Figma picks a smaller segment out of that big Adobe mature market and differentiates and be, is, is able to differentiate themselves with a, maybe a premium position and a premium price level. Very different strategies, disrupt versus differentiate, but both targeted at a relatively mature market. When you get to product market fit and you're about to double down and go to T2D3 growth and making that decision, like who do you want to be? Do you want to disrupt? Do you want to differentiate? Is extremely important. And I've seen a lot of companies uh, when they get to from five, 10 million ARR and they get funded and they go to the next stage to try to do both at the same time, for example, because they're not sure. <laughs> Let's try both. Um, and that's de definitely not a recipe for success. Um, so let me stop again. Any thoughts on this? Hello, I have a question in chat. Yeah. Let me see. Open it up here. Yeah. Market maker. I don't, it's, 
I tried to, to sort of maybe simplify things a little too much in these graphs. I think the categories can really be very different, right? The question is, how do you break out the market maker space? Like just with market shaker, I kind of think about disrupt and differentiate. Market maker is a little, a little different. I think it's about how do you create a new category, right? How do you develop a new market segment where, which doesn't have a name yet, where the problem may not descri be described very well. You have to knock on doors. You have to do a lot of awareness building, even to make the market problem aware. Um, and then come up maybe even with terminology that didn't exist before, right? That, that describes the problem, that describes the solution. Um, and I feel, so the person who asked the questions, I think David, um, I feel the answer, how do you break that up? What are the different kind of go-to-market strategies to do so? Will again, vary vastly uh, based on what type of audience you're trying to serve. Is this very much consumer or small business or is this really an enterprise play? Um, if you think of a lot of the, 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 the high growth um, technology uh, stocks in the last couple of years, the data dogs of the world, right? Um, uh, CrowdStrike, you know, there's a lot of these big companies, they're solving completely new problems, right? Authorization, authentication, security problems, uh, uh, single sign-on, Okta. They're, they all fall in that upper left quadrant, right? Where they found a new category that wasn't really well-developed, well-defined, and set the rules and, and had the technology to back that up. Um, I don't have a model to break that down much further than how I'm talking about it. There's a couple of bullets here in the upper right slide, part of the slide, right? How you kind of have to educate the market. You have to drive kind of the, the market through the chasm. <laughs> you have to find the early adopters, the innovators who are willing to help you build the product. And then of course, turn that into broader market awareness to get your early majority. Does that make sense? Um, 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 it does, it is hard, but we're doing it, so. Awesome. What are you? Uh, what what type of solution are you uh, are you building for a new category? I invented the math to, to uh, uh, convert to, 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 to raw data to being ma ma manageable as inventory. Yeah, no, that definitely sounds like an opportunity to find the right words to describe that problem right and I find see how people would call it themselves and how they can connect with that that's an amazing okay. opportunity great um so let's move so this is this is strategy right and it's important to know where you are and know where you want to go um but now you have to implement that plan as an early stage um a software company in this case but it applies to other types of companies as well um, i like to kind of start with if you know where you are <laughs> have you reached mvp product market fit or are you already in that t2d3 sort of part of the journey maybe you've got series a or series b money and you're executing on many different things at the time um, i feel each of these three is a good starting point to ask yourself uh, these three questions you have to ask these three questions for every company though it's more this real sort of shows more of a where can you start like if you have only reached mvp you may not know yet what your ideal customer profile is so it's okay for me to say hey let's first answer the question what's it for what are you really solving what problem what's your positioning right and i'll give some tools here next on how to do that um, if you have reached product market fit now it's totally valid to start with the question who is it for? Yeah, what is the ideal customer profile, the ICP, that you have now proven by getting to product market fit has value, uh, it's, it's experiencing value from your solution, right? And is willing to pay for it. You know, you have some maybe some engaged advocates, people who use it, who use more of it, who like using it, to tell others about it. All those sort of product market fit indicators allow you to now answer the question, who is it for? Um, if you're already in T2D3 mode, right, you have your dollars, you're investing in go-to-market um, sort of um, uh, scaling and accelerators and more growth levers. Now you should be able to answer the question, what are my growth um, priorities, right? If I told my investors, I can get this company from 10 to 40 million in ARR in the next couple of years, and this is why, you should be able to write down why? What are those growth priorities? And then sort of 
you know, give them values and make sure that they, they help you drive that, uh, that formula from before. And I'll, I'll give a quick framework for each of these steps. But, but ultimately, you have to answer all these three questions, right? How am I growing? How am I going to deliver on that ARR growth promise? And what's it for? What's my positioning? What's the value proposition? And who's it for? What's the ideal customer profile? Because only when you do those three things, it allows you to really nail your value proposition, your USP, whatever you, however you want to call it, you know, have your brand branding aligned with your positioning, right? The, the voice, the visuals, etc., and have some kind of a frame. I like to use Pink and Gain, some kind of a storytelling framework to make sure that all your content from your website and your messaging and your emails and your your promotions and your campaigns that it all kind of lines up with that, right? That your all the work you're doing, uh, all the things you're investing in, become an echo chamber that allows you to um, to scale. So let's talk through. Uh, these three things. So the first one is, uh, what's it for? I, I like to use this super simple framework to, to ask my, uh, myself or a company the question, hey, what is it really that we're doing that is really, really special? I started with all the things we're very good at. I call that the best column. You can, you can list anything <laughs> that you're proud of, that your company or your solution does. It can be a very long list. Um, but then you filter it down to what are the things we're truly better at, better than the other alternatives in the market, better than the competition? What are the things that really differentiate our solution? To finally get to the question, what is it, what is it that only we can do? What makes us really unique, right? What is the, the only thing that nobody else can do? If you have a CRM system, a CRM solution that is maybe integrated with QuickBooks and it also includes marketing and sales CRM tools, right? And, and maybe it's targeted at medical device suppliers. Then if you're the only one who can do that, that would be a great part of that sort of exercise and maybe there's a technical thing that you do that's super unique that nobody else can match right but you have to find that because that will be the foundation for what's called your positioning vectors right and this example comes from a book uh, by Seth Godin where he uses Brinks as a it's a very secure way to transport diamonds in this example across New York from Newark to JFK or the other way around <laughs> through the city. Um, and Brinks is very good at doing that in a certain way, right? And that allows them to, to do their positioning. In this case, it's actually the, the security level that you get and the speed, right? Which not cannot be matched. Both of those together cannot be matched by any of the other providers on this list. But of course, if you're the United States Postal Service, you would not position yourself like that. You would pick different positioning vectors, right? You would say, hey, we're, we're cheaper than Brinks, and we do it. <laughs> it's a little easier to get a stamp than to, to book a, a Brinks truck to, to pick up your, uh, your package. But it's really important to, to start with kind of what is that best, better only framework? What are the things that make us special and be extremely clear on what your positioning is. Then I always ask one more sort of, a, this is another litmus test when I meet a CEO or a founder who's very convinced about the, the value prop and the positioning. I always ask, hey, can you actually make a guarantee? If there's something that you feel you're really best at, you do better than others, is there something that you can promise um, that allows us not only from a messaging, but also positioning perspective to really put our money where our mouth is? And if you feel very comfortable with how strong your value proposition is, then it's usually possible to find something that you can guarantee, you can promise that really will set you apart and will be manageable from a risk perspective. And it's, of course, not easy, but it's a good way to kind of challenge um, the, the value, the quality of the value proposition and what makes you special. So to kind of summarize, and then I'll we'll do a quick pause again, to do positioning, that was this first question, right? What's it for? And a quick framework, and all this is in the book, like how do you find those superpowers, validate those versus others, right? What is the sort of the benchmark versus the competition versus alternatives? How good is your solution really? Are there things that only you can do? And you kind of validate that by uh, seeing if you can make a promise or uh, provide some kind of guarantee. So that's positioning. Um, any questions, any quick thoughts on that before I move to uh, who's it for the, the next part? Okay, so asking the question, who's it for, usually comes down to what's the ICP, what's your ideal customer profile? Uh, customer, in the case of a B2B, go to market is usually the description of a company of an organization that is your ideal customer profile, but it could also be personas, of course, when you um, go to market is more um, uh, uh, B2C. 
I love this method. It's, it, it requires a little bit of data digging and doing a little bit of uh, Excel uh, work or Google Sheets work. But I think it's worth it. Not necessarily at the MVP stage, but if you've reached product market fit, take a look at your customer list. And, and, and this, in this case, this is a software solution for the banking, uh, for the finance, finance vertical. And uh, so they group their customers in the sub-segments of the finance industry, which in this case were types of banks, retail banks, investment banks, you know, saving and loan banks. And all those, of course, have a size as in the market opportunity, <laughs> right? The size of the retail banking segment is bigger than the, uh, the size of the investment banking segment. So that's, you see that here in the bubble size. But then the other two uh, values that, that they looked at were both how easy is it for us to service this type of customer? How well is our solution fitted to their needs? And ability to service here is really um, um, an assessment that you would do, right? Based on maybe a one to 10 scale or something like that, that is absolutely not completely objective, right? Could be very subjective, but that includes things like how hard is it to onboard these customers? How hard is it to sell, right? Selling to a large retail bank might take months more than selling to a small uh, a small type of uh, bank with less decision makers, et cetera. So ability to service, ability to sell, the cost of doing all that, the amount of friction, that's really the vertical axis here. And then on the horizontal axis, you try to estimate your actual market share within that sub-segment. So what I'm doing here, I'm basically dividing the total ARR um, that you have secured. Let's say you have a couple of investment banks as your current customers, and that yields you, let's say, $800,000 in ARR every year. But you divide that by the total addressable ARR in that uh, total segment of investment banks. And it doesn't even have to be ARR. It could be the number of banks that there are in the United States, for example. Whatever that sort of denominator is that helps you have some kind of a proxy for the size of that market. And above the line, what your share in that segment that subsegment of the market is because it allows you on that horizontal access to to account for your uh, market share in these subsegments regardless of the size of the bubble and it's really really powerful because if you actually have an amazing penetration in one of these smaller segments for example within investment banks you might own 30 percent of that market where in the retail market, although the absolute number could be bigger, the percentage that you have in that pie is so much smaller that your chances to become a premium player and to win that subsegment are just much smaller. So I think this is just an interesting model to look at. Hey, what parts of the market do I feel I have secured a beachhead that is actually defendable, right? Whereas there is a, some form of a moat in the form of you have more market share in that sub-segment, you understand these customers better than anybody else. So when you have this, it's a great input to doing what, what a typical, you know, market uh, priority uh, exercise is, right? Going from your total addressable market, everybody you could possibly service in a certain market that maybe don't want to or can, right? You go to the SAM, right? The serviceable part of that market, what part can actually be addressed by what you do? Yeah, you rule out everybody who's you know, customers on the North Pole, <laughs> or customers that are too big, too small, or have needs that you cannot do with your solution. So that's the SAM. But far more interesting is the SOM, right? Because especially when you're a smaller company, you have limited time, limited resources. Especially when you got recent you know, growth capital, maybe at the angel stage, those dollars are going to run out relatively quick. So you better make sure that this serviceable and obtainable part of the market that you go after is small enough for you to be able to win it, to be the premium player, right? To not have to win that part of the market by, uh, by discounting, for example, and be able to then make that so clear that you can have better positioning, better messaging, right? Better content. So make the niche basically as small as you can. And I know we're, we're a little short on time, but I, I have an example here for, <laughs> it doesn't even have to be what you do. It, it has to, it can just be limited by what, what you choose to say you do. In this example, there's Nordstrom Macy's selling clothes to, to kids. And there's two other companies who do the same. They sell clothes to kids, but they've chosen to position themselves as only selling clothes to families who have twins, right? And the one, the, the one in the middle of the bottom actually only with 
from babies. <laughs> so it's niching down, right? Even if the product that you're selling is nothing different from Mason and Norse, are still clothing, but the positioning is so different that especially when you're small, it allows you to get maybe some early traction, like the the, the, the article that you see on the bottom right, where there's a, uh, an independent community pointing to this uh, website, just multiples, just because they're so focused on the audience they care about. This is about picking a niche and uh, your ideal customer profile that may not even be li limited by what you do, but it's limited by how you want to position yourself. Okay, that's the ICP. Then of course, when you sell to B2B, you have the problem that you're, <laughs> you're selling to people who sell other people's who, who spent other people's money, right? That's really the only, pro, the only real difference between B2C and B2B. Um, and that comes with the challenge that you have multiple personas in the journey. A lot of people who can say no, only a couple who can say yes. Um, a much deeper topic to go deep in, but when you think of what B2B really is, it means the journey is complexer. You have to influence both people early in the journey who could become aware, but that doesn't have to be the same audience as the people who end up making a decision or exploring options and end up maybe even on the on the right P3, the, the people who have to be sponsors or, or could be blockers. And, and B2B in that sense is a little tricky. I want to go back to the, um, to the slide we had early on about matching your your ACV and where your go-to market sort of strategy is uh, depending on that ACV to fund your go-to market machine, uh, right? And how that is kind of aligned uh, with also the maturity of the category. I made a, an earlier comment about this, but I cannot emphasize this enough. When a, when a category matures, and this is typically happening when you see startups cross the 10 million ARR, a barrier, right? When you have to go from 10 to 50, it's very seldomly that that happens in, in immature categories. And, and what then happens is that I've seen uh, being often the reason why companies struggle to make the jump from the 10 to 15 ARR to the kind of the 50 to 100 million ARR uh, range is they keep depending on a marketing led growth model. They looked at sort of what got them there organic growth, buying clicks on Google, et cetera, buying certain sponsorships. And they kind of just say, hey, if we can do 10X that, right? And we have a little more capital to do so, we can just keep growing like that. And what usually happens is that these, these um, uh, economics don't, don't hold up because when a, when a category matures, there's more competition and hiring salespeople will get more expensive and, and, and buying the clicks will get more expensive. There will not be as many clicks you know, for everybody to buy. The inventory will be limited. So what I find is to, to successfully jump from the 5 to 10 million error to the 50 to 100 million error, um, like band, you kind of have to do one of the two extremes here really well. Either you gotta got to find a way to win the sales-led growth battle in a category, have the best sales force, where you can pay those people the premium money and make sure that they stay with you. And then, of course, have the, have the premium price levels to back that up, right, to make that affordable or win the product that drone uh, battle, right? In a certain category, be the one who owns the bottom up kind of people who start using the software, tell others about it and sort of penetrate organizations through that. But in a larger, more mature category, it's very hard to, uh, to do the middle part. I am going to uh, speed through some of the next slides because I don't think we have enough time to really go deep uh, because I want to have time for a little bit of Q and A. Um, so this is, super uh, simple message when you are an early stage company i've seen companies either bet on inbound or outbound um, and it's really hard to do one of them and not do the other and succeed when, when you're early stage you need to knock on some doors so of course i love set going and i believe in inbound but if you just build content and you hope people will find you in a search engine when they're not even aware that there's a problem to be solved it's going to be hard so you need to do some outbound if you only do outbound then your economics won't work over time, right? It's just too costly, especially when you haven't figured out exactly what the ICP is. So you're, you're not able to do the laser targeting that you need to do to be able to do outbound effectively. Uh, so the reality is that most companies will need a, a funnel that comes from both inbound and outbound prospecting and actual salespeople. If you hire sales, they need to come with a with a Rolodex, not a, these days it's of course a LinkedIn list, but they need to come with their own network. People they know, they, can, they have to be able to, to bring business with them, right? A sales, especially when you go 
into the higher ACV levels, right? And you have an executive sales force. A lot of the pipe generation has to be done by those people themselves, not just depending on MQLs generated by the marketing team. And how this distribution curve is made up differs per market category and maturity of the, the category in the business, et cetera. Really important that when you uh, invest in, um, in uh, this sort of two-tier approach where you have both outbound and inbound, that you realize that a traditional outbound is probably not gonna work, right? When you have people just try to start emailing people and spam them with content, et cetera. I, I'm sure many of you get these emails or LinkedIn messages and you're not, you're ignoring them, right? So the only way to do that is really through what's called account-based marketing. That's not actually defined by everybody the same way, but, but for me, ABM is really about figuring out a way to meet people earlier in their journey, especially when you know what the ICP looks like. You can do it extremely targeted to a list of, let's say, 100 uh, ideal uh, customer prospects and have a fantastic programmatic way to find those people and reach out to them in a helpful way, in a non-spammy, you know, a value-add way that's not a sales conversation, and, and doing both at the same time is critical. If I summarize what we talked about today um, in sort of one slide, it would be this one. Um, you have to kind of drive ARR for a modern B2B SaaS company or a modern SaaS company in all these uh, three ways. And especially when you invest uh, angel capital or, or growth funding, it's very easy for people to get too much focused on the box on the right uh, to drive funnel, um, funnel size, to get more MQLs, to get more... Um, uh, conversions of those MQLs to new customers, which of course is extremely important. And it's usually, those are usually the, the, the growth levers that are easiest to describe, right? Easiest to, easiest to find, e easiest to define. Um, but the reality is when you look at long-term ARR impact, that the box on the left, it has 4X the impact on ARR growth um, than the box on the right, right? Making sure that you continue to expand existing accounts by getting more people to use the software within that account. I call this sort of um, unit penetration. In ARPU, the U stands for units, right? So how do you get more units? Could be devices, users, seats, depends a little bit on the pricing model. Um, but then of course also increase the, the actual revenue per unit, right? Uh, pricing, uh, innovation, upsell, cross-sell, all those things that you do to get the individual unit to become more um, uh, profitable for you. And then, of course, a, a really concerted way to drive referrals and, and sort of flywheel of uh, loyalty turned into more leads. Uh, and then the middle part, right? Everybody knows that churn is probably the most important metric for most SaaS companies. Uh, and that is not uh, something you want to measure. At, you know, in hindsight, you want to do something. You want to manage the leading indicators of churn, right? How do people... How do as many people use as many features as possible, right? How do you drive the frequency of the usage up? And when you coach, when you do diligence on an investment, you coach a leader of a SaaS company, making sure you spend a lot of time on the left in the left two boxes is really, really important. Um, as I mentioned, I'll, I'll, I'll skip a couple of things here that we could maybe do in a different um, in a follow up session. Um, but if you have that kind of that, that, that balanced approach, uh, then assessing the growth plan of a founder, of, a, of someone who's looking for investment capital, could be as easy as listing all the, the growth initiatives they have, right? The thesis they have on, hey, this, if, I, if you give me this amount of capital, this is, what I will, this is how I will deploy it, right? And then, you know, align that with, with some of these uh, variables, right? And, and have real you know, high quality discussions on which of these growth levels will impact which of these um, growth factors. Price is um, the most popular one these days with the current levels of inflation. I, I did a webinar about a year ago where I actually opened up with everybody should raise their price. Uh, it's such a big topic. This is a full hour webinar that I, I invite you to you know, go check it out. It is, it goes into price models, into how do you deal with inflation, but, but 10 other things around pricing, right? And how do you turn price as a vehicle to use for your positioning and, and how you go after the right parts of the market. It, it addresses the earlier freemium premium versus try buy uh, comment. Um, but also if you decide, for example, to raise price, which I think every, everybody should do right now, um, how do you do that, right? Because there's a, there's a magic to doing that in a way that is not seen as 
you know, um, predatory or uh, disruptive and where, where you communicate choice and value, et cetera, and turn that into the right economics for your company. Um, so that's something I just um, wanted to point at. Before I, um, I go to the last topic, uh, managing RevOps, any questions so far, any thoughts? Someone also asked me to, uh, for my email address, I'll just put it here in the chat for people who have to leave early. Okay, I see another question here. What are the best methods for ABM account-based marketing? Huge question. Um, ABM is, honestly, it's really a different term for what we used to call enterprise marketing 10, 15 years ago. Um, but it, for many people, includes buying lists and, and doing something mechanical with those lists, having programmatic approaches to reaching a set of accounts and the people who work there with all the different tools that we now have to do marketing from campaigns and email and outbound and LinkedIn to content marketing, but also targeted advertising to certain IP ranges, for example. Um, so ABM is a huge topic. Um, again, on my um, on the t2d3.pro website, if you go there and you just type in ABM, you find six or seven articles just on ABM. Um, and that might be a good um, a good starting point as well. Uh, RevOps, I, I want to make sure I have a couple minutes for this. This is probably the most important thing for you to expect when you are an investor in a company, right? That there's a certain amount of diligence and, and uh, operational excellence when it comes to managing the numbers. And revenue operations is a new term that kind of describes how you do this across marketing and sales and customer success in an integrated way. So you don't have to look at slides that talk about the marketing funnel and how, you know, what the cost of a lead is, but then you don't have an answer to the real important question. Does that lead actually generate revenue at the end of the day, right? And what's the, the return on advertising spend, right? Connecting the dollars invested in marketing with actual revenue contribution. And, and RevOps kind of does that. It, it brings those three things together. And you build usually a data infrastructure that allows you to have a kind of a, a rhythm. Uh, I like to have annual, quarterly, monthly, and weekly um, sort of um, meetings that have more of a locker room <laughs> um, uh, character at the weekly stage where people look forward to what's going to happen this coming week. And there's less of an analysis and insight discussion. And you do that more at a monthly level. Um, these are kind of examples of reports to be used. Um, but yeah, monthly is really about um, how's the funnel sort of behaving? What are the conversion rates? Are those assumptions that we have in our annual plan, are they holding up? Is our deal size, deal value holding up versus the assumptions we have? What are we learning? What can we adjust? Where the weekly focus is much more about how many leads actually went from marketing to sales this week. Did they get follow-up, you know, or are they stuck somewhere? Uh, what are we going to close next week, right? What's the revenue contribution that the, the sales leader can actually commit to? The, those are the things that you do on a, on a weekly basis. Okay, as we, uh, as we wrap, um, more examples here. Um, too much to go through now. A couple of examples here on making sure that you also connect the sales marketing and sales functions from a compensation perspective, right? If you measure those things together in the RevOps model as one funnel, one set of data um, uh, KPIs, then it's also important to think about compensation the same way and implement something like OKRs to actually hold everybody accountable, but more importantly, to have clarity on who has what role to play, etc. I'll wrap with um, a couple of pointers here, and then we'll have a couple minutes for Q&A. Uh, so on the T2D3 website, there's a whole bunch of templates. Some are free, some are, are, are in the membership tier. Um, a lot of templates for how do you build your ICP, your personas, your funnel analytics, how do you build your first strategy, go-to-market strategy document. Um, and you know, the one that I like the most here on the right is, is a spreadsheet that actually do a whole T2D3 kind of plan in a spreadsheet involving all those different um, KPIs we talked about. If you have marketing leaders either in your team or in your organization or the organization that you're investing in, 
I've built a masterclass out. There's about 20 lessons now, and we keep adding. We're all these because a lot of the topics we talked about today are in themselves one hour classes. Uh, you know, just how you do personas correctly. Um, so that's all in this masterclass series. There's even a certification program that we launched. Um, so that's another kind of plug. Uh, all of this is on the T2D3 website, the T2D3.pro. Um, yeah, with that, let's, uh, let's see if there are any questions. And I see a lot of people like the amount of content. I, I'm so apologizing for rushing through it a little bit, but I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad people could keep up with the speed. Does anyone have any questions for Stein? See lot, lot, lots of great kudos <laughs> in the in the chat. All right. Um. So so the, if if there are um no no further questions, re really really appreciate Stein for taking the time today to share and all this fantastic content, all his insights with us. Uh, if you have any questions again, for, to follow up, uh, there, there is, uh, I think his, uh, his, he shared some slides that describe his website. Uh, we also be sharing his contact information as well as the set of the slides. Uh, if you, assuming you sign up on the Eventbrite link today. All right, so I, uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to again, thanks Dan for, for spending the time with us and to thank everyone else for being part of our session today. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, and all the suggestions in chat. I'm happy to come uh, do engage, speak, or anything you uh, you think is helpful for your teams. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, AJ, and thanks everyone for listening. Thank you. Thanks again. Wonderful, everyone, and have a great rest of the week. Thank you.